mon nom, c'est Émilie Poirier. Je suis la responsable des courts-métrages ici au FNC. Je suis la modératrice du Q&A. So, you've just watched program number one of national competition. Vous venez de visionner le programme numéro un de la compétition nationale with the films Vivin from Nisha Plaza, Comme la neige au printemps de Marie-Ève Juste, August 22nd this year from Graham Foy, L'étang la nuit de Olivia Boudreau, Zen Basketball from Mike Olbu, Point and Line to Plane from Sofia Bordanovitz, and Anishka de Vincent Teuil. With us today, we have for the Q&A, avec nous aujourd'hui pour le Q&A, nous avons Nisha Plazer. Hey. Bonjour. Graham Foy. Olivia Boudreau. Bonjour. Sofia Bogdanovitz. Salut! Et Vincent Teuil. Bonjour. So, first of all, thanks for accepting our invitation. Donc, merci d'avoir euh, accepté notre invitation autant au festival qu'au Q&A. On va commencer avec une question euh, plus générale. So, we'll start with a general question. So, each of us can, like, introduce yourself, uh, introduce your practice, and also uh, your film, what is uh, your film about that you're showing at FNC? Donc, uh, vous pouvez uh, vous présenter, présenter votre pratique et présenter le film qui est programmé au FNC. Et on va commencer avec, so we'll start with Nisha. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Nisha Platzer. I'm based in Vancouver. Um, And I have a mostly documentary and experimental film practice. So I am part of a film collective here called Iris Film Collective. And we work with 16 millimeter and uh, Super 8 and other handmade practices. Um, my film Viven is a film I made uh, in Cuba as part of my school there. And it's about um, a young man who is completely fascinated and obsessed with trains. Thank you so much, Nisha. We'll follow it with Graham. Hi, my name is Graham Foy. I am based in Toronto, Ontario, and my practice is primarily narrative, but I think that this film sort of follows a hybrid documentary narrative approach um, and is somewhat more experimental, I think, than some of my past works. Um, the film is about uh, civilization at peace with apocalypse. <laughs> Good description. Thank you, Graham. Maintenant, on peut y aller avec Olivia. Bonjour, euh, mon nom est Olivia Boudreau. Euh, je viens du monde des arts visuels, euh, de l'installation vidéo, euh, d'une pratique plus expérimentale. Puis, au cours des dernières années, ce travail-là a pris une tangente de plus en plus narrative. Euh, mon film est à propos de ce que l'on croit comprendre, croit entendre, croit voir et euh, de ce qu'on peut faire de tout ça. Merci, Olivia. So we'll continue with Sophia. Hi, uh, my name is Sophia and um, yeah, my my short film is called Point in Line to Plane. And um, I guess my background or my practice um, previous to um, this film has been more, I guess, in creative nonfiction and, and hybrid, um, where I mix um, documentary and fiction together um, in different uh, ways and forms. Um, and uh, this film is about, um, Yeah, my friend's passing um, two years ago, and I went through uh, this period of magical thinking. Um, I read this book called uh, The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion, and it's this phenomenon um, coined by um, Freud, where uh, you try to search for meanings and signs and coincidences when someone um, passes away. So I went through a period of this, and um, the film is very much a, a documentation of that. Thank you. Et le dernier, on peut y avec Vincent. Bonjour, mon nom est Vincent Toy. Euh, je suis de Montréal et mon film s'appelle Anexia. Euh, je fais des films de documentaire et de fiction. 
Et le film Anikshah est tourné à l'île Maurice. C'est une jeune femme qui vient de se euh, marier dans un mariage, mariage arrangé de la diaspora indienne, tamoul pour être précis. Et elle euh, se retrouve euh, dans un emploi dans les centres d'appel de l'île Maurice où euh, elle a, disons, une affaire qui se passe avec son euh, superviseur français, joué par Laurent Lucas. <rire> Merci Vincent. So we'll continue with another like general question for all of you guys. So I want to know like what interests you like in fiction and cinema? Are you more focused like on the visual aspect of filmmaking, like uh, art direction, styling, cinematography, or is it more like the starting point with the actors interaction or what is your relation to sound design and like is music is part of your writing like how you uh, envision like fiction and it's in a big like question like why is fictional a kind of a fictional cinema is your outlet so we'll start with that question i will say it in french too so donc, qu'est-ce qui vous intéresse dans le cinéma de fiction? Est-ce que vous êtes plus interpellé par le côté visuel de la chose, la direction artistique, le stylisme, la direction de la photographie? Euh, C'est quoi votre relation au son, à l'image, euh, la composition musicale? Est-ce que, sinon, vous, vous êtes plus dans le, la notion de travailler avec des acteurs de très près et de développer avec les acteurs? Donc, euh, pourquoi avez-vous choisi le cinéma de fiction pour vous exprimer? So, we'll start with that question again with Nisha. Okay, um, that's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, I, I would say that first and foremost, I, well, this film is actually the first film that I've really made with a central character. Like a lot of my previous films have been without characters um, and often I don't work with a crew. Often mm -hmm. I would just be working alone and it's more abstract and um, more visual than anything else. So this was quite a departure from that for me to be working with a, with a central character and with a whole crew. And um, so for me, it was a lot, with, like I was, really was concerned with um, having a, a strong relationship with Nori, who's our, our only character in the mm -hmm. film. Um, and we were shooting under really, really tight time constraints. Um, there was also a fuel crisis going on in the country at the time. So a lot of, um, just a lot of obstacles, you know, mm -hmm. on top of the usual obstacles that there are when you're making a film. So I was really, um, like relationships with, between me and, and the character, but also just with the whole crew, like we really had to be super, super solid together and take care of each other. And I think we, we did that really well. Um, And aside from that, yeah, definitely the sound design was, was um, something that we were thinking about from even before we started to shoot and kind of like how the place and how his way of moving in the space was going to be represented in that. Um, and yeah, again, it was like a very intense timeline. We mm -hmm. shot in five days and did all the post-production in 10 days. So um Yeah, it was intense is the way to put it. <laughs> um, uh, but I think just thinking about all of these things from a broad perspective, like what are the broad themes that we want to bring out? So it was for me, movement, waiting and transition mm -hmm. were kind of like the very vague, broad mm -hmm. terms that I was thinking about. And then kind of like bringing that into the space and the character and the, the story that we were telling with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nisha. So we can follow this question with uh, Graham. Um, great question. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that with this, this film, I really wanted to sort of try, I guess, a different approach uh, to my process as a filmmaker. And I wanted to really, I think, simplify what I was doing and try to approach uh, the film with sort of what was close at hand. So I think like part of, part of the film, um, I guess the audience has at this point seen the film. So there's a painting that sort of begins the film. And I was really inspired by um, the idea of painting or, or, or 
the way that an artist works on a painting, sort of using materials that are very um, simple and intangible and sort of, I think that really influenced my approach in terms of um, making the film. And I also really uh, was inspired by, I'm a big fan of Close Encounters of the Third Kind as a type of um, like apocalypse movie or uh, a movie that sort of maybe could be described as an anti-apocalypse movie where instead mm -hmm. of, you know, the aliens coming uh, to earth at the end of the film to destroy human civilization, they come in, in like jam uh, with people, which I think, <laughs> think is pretty cool. So uh, I was really inspired by this idea to make a film where these people were all sort of um, peacefully navigating this, mm -hmm. this, um, the end of the end of time essentially and so i guess in in doing that i just started following this thread um through my neighborhood and sort of places that were uh close at hand in my life and and tried to incorporate these these really sort of simple ideas and places and people that were close to me into sort of the creation mm -hmm. of the film and it sort of came together much more organically it wasn't it wasn't all like totally preconceived mm -hmm. so working within this larger framework i think i found uh, a really exciting new way to sort of approach making films oh cool thank you so much donc on va continuer avec la même question pour olivia um, pour moi je pense que le point de départ est toujours uh, une atmosphère que j'ai envie de, de capturer euh, donc c'est visuel et c'est sonore, c'est vraiment de l'ordre de l'atmosphère, puis c'est quelque chose qui était présent dans, dans mon travail quand, dans les installations vidéo euh, puis dans les films d'art que j'ai fait euh, puis maintenant je pense que ce qui a fait ce qui a tiré les atmosphères vers une structure plus narrative euh, c'est mon besoin d'explorer euh, la psychologie des personnages euh, et puis je trouve qu'il y a quelque chose de, de fascinant à accrocher la psychologie d'un personnage à une, à une atmosphère mm -hmm. euh, parce que pour moi ça devient une, une manière de donner corps à, à, à une pensée qui peut être complexe euh, et puis à des à, à, à des réflexions qui sont de l'ordre de l'impression, de qui sont très fugaces. Mm -hmm. euh, alors, euh, le son et l'image, évidemment, euh, mais ce qui est d'autant plus important, je pense, dans le contexte d'une pratique en, en cinéma, pour moi, c'est le, les dialogues, puis tout ce qui est révélé de la, de la psychologie des personnages à travers l'atmosphère. Merci, Olivia. So, same question for Sophia. Yeah, I can relate actually a lot to what Graham was saying about following a thread, because mm -hmm. I think that's very much what happened to me is um, when my friend passed away, it's this thing that happens called magical thinking that I had described when I was explaining what the film was about, where your brain just can't, it just doesn't understand that that person um, is gone. So as a way of continuing the relationship, you're just looking for things in your everyday as like a sign or like a message from that person. And the way for me to make this film was to um, adopt an approach of process cinema, which I learned from Bill Hoffman, who I was studying with at York University, because this was my thesis film at York. And um, what process cinema taught me is to really look at what the film wants to be. So instead of just kind of like having a script and like forcing it into this like box or this like vehicle, you kind of like make the film and kind of see how you can incorporate variables around you into the narrative line. So the film started really for me when I was at the Guggenheim two weeks before my friend's passing. And because like the film is about um, grieving and experiencing time in a very nonlinear way that was changed for the purposes of this narrative. But I found this coincidence between encountering Hilma off Clint in the Guggenheim and Kandinsky Um, and just, just kept following all of these signs and things that were pertinent to mine and my friend's relationship. 
um, and collected all these things like on my iPhone. Um, I collected more when I was in St. Petersburg, um, Russia the year after. And after I collected all of these things that I felt like were a strong summation of what I was experiencing and what our relationship was, um, I wrote this letter to my grandmother that kind of explained um, how I was feeling and it just kind of poured out of me. Um, and then I worked with actor Derek Campbell to kind of restage all of these moments that um, I had experienced. So for me, it was like a very loose structure. It took like about nine months to kind of put together, but it was about experiencing things, feeling things intuitively, capturing them, and then kind of packaging them into um, a narrative. And um, sound-wise, I was really lucky to work with Jacqueline Mills, who's based in, in Montreal, a dear friend of mine. Um, and we really wanted to create this experience of a person who was really kind of like cocooned mm -hmm. in grief. Because when you're going through something like that, things feel normal, but they're just like a little bit off. And we really wanted to portray that in the film. So um, I also worked with um, a really great score composer, Stefana uh, Fratillo, who made this like, um, like drone kind of like humming sound that kind of like moves mm -hmm. throughout the film, which was also something um, that I kind of felt while I was grieving. Like you, you feel like you're very much here and present, but there's always like, something that's kind of sitting um, on your shoulders. So that's what we were trying to do with all of those elements. I, I hope that answers your question <laughs> properly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> so on va continuer avec Vincent. Oui, euh, juste, juste avant de continuer, si vous entendez du bruit à l'arrière, c'est mon voisin qui fait, qui fait des rénovations, ah, bah, sinon, les aléas du arrête. Zoom. <rire> Donc, euh, euh, ben, le, mon travail de réalisation, l'aspect qui m'intéresse vraiment, c'est euh, l'aspect du storytelling. Mm -hmm. euh, donc, je commence par, par ça et la structure et, et toutes les façons de construire une histoire dans le documentaire comme dans la fiction. Je pense que c'est euh, des choses qui m'intéressent. Et au niveau stylistique, euh, j'essaie des choses. J'essaie... Mm -hmm. Toujours des nouvelles choses euh, qui, 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 qui m'intéressent à cette époque-là. Donc, euh, c'est très divers. Et les films que je fais sont quand même euh, un à l'autre. Il y a quelque chose qui, qui suit, mais c'est quand même assez différent comme film. Euh, le, la ligne directrice qui suit dans mes films, c'est vraiment plus thématique. Mm -hmm. euh, par exemple, euh, les films que je fais, je, je dis souvent comme... Euh, comme une joke que je fais des films dans des îles post-coloniaux françaises <rire> qui est quand dire même que assez ça, est spécifique. Très vrai. <rire> donc mais c'est arrivé que c'est des lieux où j'étais à cette époque et j'ai fait mm. des films et je suis de l'île Maurice aussi donc euh, ça fait partie de mon passé et de mon présent donc euh, c'est vraiment les structures dans les sociétés euh, les structures de pouvoir qui m'intéressent et euh, la colonisation aussi euh, étant une des grosses euh, euh, vagues qui a changé le monde. Ça, c'est quelque chose qui, euh, qui, que j'aime explorer. Et comment est-ce que les sociétés, les, les personnes évoluent à travers ça? Euh, évoluent pour créer quelque chose de nouveau? Euh, évoluent pour euh, juste couper du passé? Donc, différentes façons, des questions qu'on se pose aussi en ce moment même, je pense, euh, au Canada. Donc, euh, mm -hmm. ça, c'est les, les, les thèmes qui m'intéressent euh, dans le storytelling. Mm -hmm. ah, merci, Vincent. So, we'll go into more specifics about your films. So, I will start with Nisha. We'll go back. Uh, your film is about, like, uh, like you said, like you shoot in Cuba and... Uh, It was really about like exploring like a young man, but like for train like arrival and departure. And I wanted to know more about why you wanted to explore uh, these um, these uh, these um, these feeling of in a sensory like uh, exploration of these uh, concepts. Okay. Um, yeah. Like I guess um, I was. 
I was drawn to to Nori and also to we, we have a shared um, love of trains and the train tracks and for me that's kind of a yeah a connection to arrival and depart departure but also yeah I guess to what has come before and and what has yet to come and this kind of there's something predetermined about that the way a train track is laid out and the schedule of a train but there's also a lot of kind of mystery and nostalgia around it that I I just find very magical and um yeah for me like I I am working on a, another film that's about my brother who I lost 20 years ago um and he you know train tracks is something that reminds me of, of my brother like I'll, I'll go and walk along the train tracks when they need to kind of be with him or think about him and there was something in Nori's spirit that really reminded me of my brother that really like brought us close super fast um and yeah there was just like kind of even his body is kind of like gangly like long limbs and um yeah there so there was there was something there that you know despite the many the the intensity and the many obstacles of making this film is also the first time of directing in Spanish and um it was yeah I would say just something on kind of a more spiritual level that like connected both of us to the environment and to each other mm -hmm. and was it like already your idea before meeting this person or You wanted to work on like trains in Cuba and everything, or it came because of this encounter with Nori? Um, the so the broad ideas of working around themes of transition and movement were already there, mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't sure if they were gonna if I was gonna find a subject that would allow me to incorporate those things, and I think kind of as we were, as we were making the film, I still was full of doubt about it. Um, and maybe those things kind of fell into the background. And then later in the, in the edit, it was like, oh, actually these are kind of being pulled into the, into the work in a more natural way than I expected rather than like, you know, you don't have to be on set kind of like forcing these, it's like, the theme is movement and the theme is, but it was just not happening naturally because of, Um, I mean, huge, hugely because of like the talent of our editor, Angel Suarez, who, you know, we spent like days and nights trying to kind of like decide about how we were going to, you know, if we were going to use dialogue, there was a lot that we shot with dialogue. We decided not to, not to include in the end and just um, that through, yeah, I guess just through Nori's body a lot of it like he has such an interesting kind of like physicality to him mm. um that it was like okay in the middle of this pretty chaotic time in cuba where there's like mm. reduced transportation like food shortages you know some of that is not new for cuba but it was really pronounced at that time mm. with the fuel crisis um in the middle of all that choosing to go with like the most intimate and letting his body tell, you know, these kind of like convey these ideas of, of movement and transition. Um, so I think, yeah, that was kind of what, mm -hmm. what we ended up doing. Mm -hmm. And also um, because of these themes, you could have done like a more documentary approach to your cinematography. Why you chose to put it more like, uh, but the well, it's like a really, really well imaged it's really beautiful like uh, the DOP is like completely like amazing so why did you choose to go in a more maybe lyrical way of uh, showing this mm -hmm. yeah Maria Gracia Goya is a fantastic fantastic cinematographer um, and colorist and her and and also Ronnie Cubier who was assisting they um, yeah I think because we had as a team talked about these like broad ideas beforehand, those were kind of working with us through those like intense mm -hmm. days of, of shooting. Um, and also like really, you know, we, we knew we wanted to be close to him. Like we knew, we knew we wanted mm -hmm. to stick really close to Nori. So that was always like kind of this close quarters filming and, and moving with him and, and letting him lead a lot of the time. And 
he's super unpredictable. It was like, there were times when he would be very still and very quiet. And then all of a sudden he'd just like jump up and like, we're all running after him, like trying to keep up and kind of like, what's he going to do next? Um, and, and he's so playful as well. It was like, there would be times where we would be, you know, maybe talking about a shot or setting something up and we look over and he's like found a new, found like a trolley, for example, that he just um, ended up like playing with all day. And he has just like this real bright sense of youth about him. And I think that she, she captured both that and as well as this kind of darkness Mm -hmm. as well that's within him and within, you know, like being someone who is 18 years old in rural Cuba, Mm -hmm. there's so much uncertainty um, about their lives. Um, And I think that it was, yeah, it was just um, very impressive how she was able to like visually incorporate that um, yeah. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go with uh, Graham. Um, you said your film is like a meditation of death and like collective acceptance of mortality and everything. But at the same time, I feel it's like really poetic. Like it's not like completely like sad and rough. Like uh, was it like an intention to you to to bring like more light into that? Yeah, I think I think a, a big part of the film for me was I was thinking a lot about. Um, I mean, we're facing many existential crises. I feel like collectively, now this this film was made before the current, maybe most or the several most prescient existential crises. So when I was making this film, I was thinking a lot about the climate crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, and what, when I was thinking about the, the climate crisis and, and doing research um, for another film, uh, it started to, to feel like almost biblical to me, the, these sort of events that, that have been happening. And I think a lot of artists have sort of drawn parallels to that, um, to this idea of the, these sort of like biblical um, disasters, I guess. And, mm-hmm. and so I was thinking about art and and painting specifically and how um painting has this history of of sort of representing these or like prophesizing these um Mm -hmm. disasters or uh, in in a religious context and so um i i was really lucky to work with um darby milbrath who's a a local painter from toronto Mm -hmm. um, or who works in toronto Uh, and together we sort of talked about what would a representation of sort of the end of time look like? And I didn't show her, we had kind of shot, um, I think all of the footage for the film at that point, except for this painting that that she was going to create specifically for the film. And, um, and I think that through our discussions and, and through sort of talking through some of these ideas, I sort of realized that that part of the film is also about this idea of um, the 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 possibility that there's no guarantee of a, a future um, for for any of us, and and so I really I think through the entire process was really struck by this idea of um, using this framework of, of of like an apocalypse film um, to reveal the magic of the present and and really focus on that. Um, to really sort of unearth, I think, and draw attention to uh, the the moment that we're all in, sort of collectively together. And so that I think that that was really the the driving idea or the driving sort of um, uh, feeling that I wanted to get across by showing showing the present as it is, but also sort of hopefully um, revealing it in in a new way and 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 showing showing something that that is quite. Um, miraculous about what we all are what what's at stake to lose i guess Mm -hmm. and was the collaboration with the painter at the beginning of the project or you were thinking about doing like this meditation before like what came first for this idea the painting was something that was sort of in the back of my mind through the process but i shot we collectively shot the film 
um, before I approached RV about mm -hmm. the painting. Um, and in, in many ways, I kind of see her, the work, like Darby isn't physically in the film, but her painting um, occupies, I think, the first minute or two minutes of the, the film. And in a way, I started thinking about the painting as performance or something. I almost feel like the painting, or, or sorry, the, the film, like stars Darby's performance as a, as a painter, as, a, as like a, an artist in this fictional world. Mm -hmm. um, creating this this visual prophecy um, and I think that the film also sort of to me has started to feel almost like like a filmic version of, of that idea of like creating this sort of like uh, prophetic representation of, of um, the end or something so the, the end of time I guess and also like I'm going to the more visual way of like your cinematography, it's grainy, it's interesting, the format. Can you elaborate on your choices for this film? I think, yeah, the, it was kind of, I think it was kind of a naive um, idea to shoot this film on 35 mm -hmm. millimeter because of the camera. It's a very observational a film. A lot of the, the moments were, uh, you know, we were, me and my wife who, who co-produced the film with Dan Montgomery, um were just kind of pulling this really very very large camera around in a, a wagon um which, which it's like a it's like a production camera so it's it's yeah. kind of cumbersome to move um and sort of the the physical i, I guess restrictions of, of shooting on a camera that big and heavy kind of, i think like informed some of the yeah. the ways in which i i shot the, mm -hmm. or that we shot the film uh and how we were exploring some of the environments but i but i i really did want to i think like capture these these small moments um or these very yeah these very like intimate details on like a, a grand scale or put them on, on on like a larger stage so that i think that was sort of the the idea of um or that informed the idea of shooting the film on a cumbersome large format as for proof 35 millimeter Oh, cool. Thank you so much, Graham. So we'll go to, on va continuer avec Olivia. Donc, ben, ton film, en fait, c'est vraiment intéressant. Et je voulais savoir, euh, tu sais, on a vraiment aussi vu de la chaîne dans ton film. Est-ce qu'il y a des collaborations directement avec tes actrices? Est-ce que tout est scripté d'avance ou il y a vraiment euh, juste une trame que tu dis, il faut qu'on se rende environ là? Ou tout est vraiment très préparé d'avance avec elle? Tout est très préparé d'avance. <rire> Vraiment, euh, ben, tout le texte était écrit, euh, le découpage, c'est vraiment, ça, 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 euh, ça, ça, me, ça me fâche un peu, mais j'ai la fâcheuse tendance à respecter mes scénarios, mes découpages. Euh, je suis très méthodique, euh, en fait, en général, alors euh, euh, non, il n'y a pas d'improvisation euh, dans le film. Non, pas du tout. Puis en fait... Euh... Comment tu as trouvé ce, ce... Comment t'as bâti cette histoire-là autour de, de cet événement, ce qui vont à un étang, et là, il se confie mm -hmm. des choses. Mm -hmm. euh, Peux-tu nous, 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 nous décrire comment tu as pensé à cette histoire-là, puis qu'est-ce qui t'a inspiré dans ce non-dit, dans ces impressions, et comment les créer à l'écran? Mm -hmm. C'est vraiment la rencontre de plusieurs euh, obsessions, je dirais. Euh, J'avais... Euh... J'avais le lieu de l'étang en tête, euh, la nuit, euh, de ce petit cocon de l'eau. Un étang, c'est vraiment pas comme un lac, euh, c'est pas non plus comme juste la forêt. Il y a vraiment comme un écosystème, une atmosphère euh, sonore euh, qui est très particulière. Fait que j'avais je, 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 envie de filmer ça, d'y donner corps. Euh, j'avais envie de travailler euh, un dialogue entre, entre deux femmes. Mm -hmm. euh, J'avais des, des actrices particulières en tête qui ne sont pas nécessairement celles qui sont dans le film, mais j'avais comme l'impression qu'il y avait une rencontre qui pouvait avoir lieu. Euh, puis, euh, j'étais aussi... Euh, Je suis obsédée par My Dinner with André. Euh, je ne sais pas si vous voyez... 
Mm. Bon, un film dans lequel ils sont à table euh, tout au long du film, puis qu'ils discutent. Puis ce film-là, je l'ai vu trois, quatre fois, puis j'ai toujours l'impression d'avoir vu les scènes. Donc, mm. d'avoir vu les rituels auxquels euh, l'acteur euh, a participé, le metteur en scène, en fait. Mm. Puis il euh, y a quelque chose pour moi d'incroyablement fort là-dedans, parce que le, le cinéma est convié par les mots, par le langage, puis rencontre... Euh, euh, toute une capacité d'imagerie du spectateur. Fait que j'avais comme ces trois affaires-là. Et tu voulais jumeler. Je poursuivais, puis il y a comme, comme beaucoup de, 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 des projets puis de la création de chacun. Je pense à un moment donné, les choses s'emboîtent. Il y a euh, beaucoup de travail, un peu de magie, puis j'en suis arrivée à, à, cette, mm -hmm. à ce scénario-là. Mm -hmm. C'est vraiment intéressant. Mais en même temps, c'est très, très doux. Puis c'est vraiment dans le non-dit aussi qu'est-ce qu'on voit. Tout le reste, vraiment respirer le film et tout. Est-ce est que c'était difficile pour toi de créer ces atmosphères-là pour laisser le spectateur vivre la chose en même temps qu'elle? Hmm. Je pense que c'est vraiment proche de mon rythme à moi. Ouais. Parce que c'est proche de mon rythme à moi, c'est pas quelque chose que je réfléchis mm -hmm. tant que ça. Euh, ça vient euh, naturellement s'inscrire dans le montage, euh, dans les plans. Euh, puis c'est certain que parce que le propos du film était particulièrement... Euh, est assez dur à un certain mm -hmm. moment, j'avais envie que ça, ça, ça existe euh, dans beaucoup de délicatesse. Ouais. Euh, alors, euh, je, je voulais... Ça, c'est quelque chose que j'aime, quand ça me semblait comme dangereux comme matériel. Alors, j'avais envie de travailler les craintes pour que ça puisse euh, se rendre au spectateur de la, de la meilleure façon possible. Mm -hmm. Puis quand ça s'est passé, en fait, après avoir tourné ces scènes-là, qui sont quand même émotives, c'est quand même des, des, des grands travaux d'acteurs, euh, comment ça s'est passé au montage? Est-ce que tu avais beaucoup d'options? Comment ça s'est passé? Est-ce que tu as réécrit ton film à ce moment-là euh, ou ça restait euh, encore comme le bon film que tu avais vu? <rire> je ne sais pas ça. <rire> euh, euh, on a fait, euh, donc si on fait référence au, au long monologue, euh, par exemple, on a fait euh, trois prises, dont une prise, la première qui a été interrompue. Euh, okay. Puis c'était important de faire euh, que le monologue soit livré d'un coup parce qu'il y a vraiment une courbe euh, dans tout ce monologue-là que je pense pas, euh, qui n'aurait pas pu être maîtrisé en filmant un segment. Donc, le monologue euh, a quelque chose de performatif. Ça demandait à Evelyne euh, beaucoup de concentration. Euh, ça lui demandait de se rendre dans un, un lieu très, très précis euh, pour être capable de surfer cette vague-là. Euh, et puis... Quand je suis arrivée en montage, donc euh, première prise interrompue, deuxième prise, pas tout à fait juste selon moi, euh, on fait une troisième prise euh, avec des nouvelles indications. Puis la troisième prise me semble parfaite, ou en tout cas, avec la troisième prise, on est allé aussi loin qu'on aurait pu aller, je pense, à ce moment-là. Euh, ben, la tentation au montage, c'était de ne pas couper ah ouais. le monologue. Puis euh, j'ai travaillé... Euh, j'ai travaillé autour de ça pour essayer de faire fonctionner le monologue en bloc aussi parce que je trouvais qu'on pouvait vraiment apprécier la qualité du jeu d'Evelyne s'il n'y avait pas de coupe. Euh, mais ce n'était pas ça le film. Euh, ouais. Ça ne fonctionnait pas. Fait que, euh, fait que j'ai monté mon scénario. <rire> non, mais c'est bon. Dans le fond, ton cinéma, il est vraiment créé dès l'écriture. Puis c'est là que tu as ta réponse directe. Là, donc... Euh... C'est intéressant de voir parce qu'il y a d'autres cinéastes qui sont dans l'autre, qui, qui écrivent certaines lignes et tout se passe avec le jeu d'acteur. Toi, tu es vraiment dans la préparation, dans la pré-production de ce euh, film. Après, au montage, on rencontre toujours les limites du tournage, oui. puis il faut s'adapter, bien entendu. Tu sais, J'ai déjà laissé tomber des pans d'une histoire dans un film parce que j'y arrivais pas, mais euh, j'ai une idée généralement assez précise de ce que je veux faire. Ah ben merci, euh, Lia. Un plaisir. So, we'll continue with uh, Sophia. So, your, uh, your story is quite personal when we read text that, like, I can't, like is with your film. It's, like, mm -hmm. your life. So, how is it to also, like, relive all of this in 
processing the cinema and shooting and like rewriting and working with an actress on your own uh, life experience? It's a great question. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's funny, Emily, because when I like look back on this film, I don't know how I made it. Yeah. I really don't. Because I think after making it, I think like everything around it is just extraordinarily hard. Like talking about it, putting a press kit together, all of like the things afterwards that are supposed to be easy with making the film have been just like excruciatingly um, difficult because it, I think it is a very, I think, vulnerable film for me. I admit to a lot um, in the film and I dug really deep. But for me, it really felt like something I didn't really have control of. I feel like the film and the process and the images chose me in this strange way. And I was just kind of like this conduit for things that just kind of started appearing. Um, like the film started um, when I was at the Guggenheim trying to see this Helma Off Clint show. Um, and what was really interesting is that um, my friend died on Hilma Off Clint's birthday. Um, and he died when I was in Vienna and I discovered that him and Mozart had the same birthday. So there are all these things that, that just kind of like piled up on my plate that I didn't really have control over that I kind of started threading together. When I look back at that film, I can tell that I, I wasn't well, like I was going through a very serious period of, um, I think, depression um, and grieving. And it's very, I think, surreal looking mm -hmm. back on that because it was a period of creativity that I've never really um, experienced before. But I think um, sharing the work as vulnerable as it mm -hmm. um, makes me feel, I think has been, um, a satisfying experience even though it's kind of I think a little bit challenging as well and and also like uh, your work is all like is in the border of like documentary fiction your previous mm. part too like in this case were you more uh appeal to like work in a more documentary way or you wanted to be more fictional than ever like you were inspired by your life but you wanted to go more fictional or more documentary on this particular subject? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question because like the film, like all of like, I suppose the B-roll of the footage was shot like very documentary. Like I was just shooting things that I was just like naturally attracted to. But the moments that are restaged with um, Derek Campbell, which took place over the course of three or four days are I think like the most, I think like staged and more narrative looking um, moments that I've ever had um, in any of my um, work. And I think for me, I think like genre aside, I think it was just really, really important for me to um, articulate what I was going through. I think that very naively and kind of like making this film, if I had like all of my feelings that were in like one container, that was just like, here it is, this is what happened, and this is how I'm feeling, and this is, mm -hmm. um, I guess, this process that I went through, I, I naively thought that these feelings would go away, but um, they didn't. <laughs> I ended up with a, a film, but it was, it was a really, really interesting, I think, thing to go through, and what was really great about, I mean, working with Dara and the benefit to having her as a close friend, and I think it was also particularly challenging for her because this was something that she supported me mm. through and she's never gone through I think a period of grieving like that but I think a lot of what she witnessed and supported me through is embodied I think in mm. that um, performance so I think the film for me um, as well represents I think a lot of Dara's um, generosity um, mm. as a performer. And as you said, like you were shooting like naturalistic thing. Uh, have you mm -hmm. shot for a long time images for this film or it was like in a real short period of time, like? Mm. Yeah, so I started shooting um, in New York in um, October um, and I had collected all this footage and I shot it on my iPhone um, on 4K. 
Um, and with things that I shot on my iPhone, like while I was traveling, so I shot in New York in October, in Iceland um, the year after in March, um, and in St. Petersburg as well. There are some things that I captured um that just were there that I that I shot with my iPhone so then what I did is I transferred them to uh 16 millimeter super 16 with a Bullock's camera and I did that by shooting it off of my um computer screen so I could marry the two formats um it's really interesting because I think those moments some of those moments pass for film but again going back to the sound design when you're looking at those images there's something there that doesn't feel quite right like it's film but it's not film and I think it kind of embodies this feeling of grieving of being in this like very strange state of mind and being in this liminal space and in kind of like mixing the docufiction formats and kind of playing I guess like with I guess the the genre that I typically work in but really melting it together I think um, messing with those two formats worked very well I think conceptually. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you so much, Sophia, for our... It's a pleasure. Donc, on va terminer aussi avec Vincent. Donc, comme tu l'as déjà dit, ton film prend place à l'île Maurice, dans une famille indienne de, de, de tu sais, plus tamoul, en fait. Et c'est vraiment intéressant comment tu mélanges beaucoup de cultures et de choses qu'on on, on voit rarement au cinéma. Donc, ça fait vraiment du bien de, de voir ce, ce truc-là et de de où, en fait, est venue cette inspiration de parler de cette femme indienne mariée tamoul à l'île Maurice qui travaille pour une institution française, comme de toutes marier ces choses-là ensemble? Le, le premier... Euh, L'idée du film avait commencé dans... Euh, je m'intéressais au centre d'appel mm -hmm. euh, à l'île Maurice. C'est un, une industrie qui est en train, en plein essor. Okay. Et euh, il y avait une prof euh, de l'HEC qui m'avait contacté, ayant vu mon, mon dernier film, Le cri du Lambi. Mm -hmm. euh, Blandine Emilia, elle est mauricienne, et elle est dans les ressources humaines. Donc, euh, euh, on, a, on a jasé un peu, et là, elle m'avait dit qu'elle avait fait une recherche sur euh, les centres d'appel de l'île Maurice. Et elle m'a aidé à, à concocter un peu cette histoire, comprendre comment, euh, comment ça se passe là-bas. Donc, il y a des, des, plein de choses que, que, comme Mauricien, tu viens, tu travailles, c'est un endroit qui te permet d'être hors des champs de Cannes mm -hmm. ou euh, travailler à l'usine euh, textile mm -hmm. ou dans les hôtels de luxe. Donc, pour, euh, pour les Mauricien, c'est quand même un, un, un travail qui te permet d'ouvrir tes horizons. Donc, ça m'intéressait vraiment parce que quand même, euh, c'est des industries qui s'implantent à l'Émaurice et ils répètent un peu les, les, les vieilles aztèques coloniaux, euh, ouais. c'est-à-dire euh, tu ne peux pas parler créole à l'Émaurice. Euh, il y a toujours ah, les superviseurs sont. Il faut français, il faut apprendre à parler d'une certaine façon aussi. Ouais. Donc il y a toute une éducation de langage qui est compréhensible pour le business global. Euh, c'est normal, mais comme quand tu arrives à, à, à un niveau social, ça devient très complexe mm -hmm. euh, parce que les superviseurs sont d'habitude, c'est des Français ou des Anglais, dépendant de, du centre d'appel. Donc, ça, ça devient des, des situations sociétales très complexes et les structures de pouvoir commencent à émerger de ça. Donc, il y avait ça. L'île Maurice, bien sûr, c'est un pays qui est très multiculturel. Donc, euh, dans la création de cette jeune femme, ce, ce, ce personnage tamou qui, qui est dans un mariage arrangé, c'est quelque chose de très naturel qui, 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 qui a en suit euh, de l'histoire. Donc, euh, euh, ça peut avoir un peu l'air étranger, mais c'est quand même, c'est ce qui se passe à l'île Maurice. Oui, mais, mais ton nez, je me disais, je, on sait que l'île Maurice est très multiculturelle, puis je me demandais pourquoi tu es allé justement dans cette, dans cette femme tamoule. En fait, ça aurait pu être plein d'autres choses, plein d'autres trucs. Est-ce que tu avais un accès, euh, un accès à une femme de ce genre-là là-bas que tu connais de façon personnelle ou c'est vraiment juste une inspiration? Euh... Euh, c'est une inspiration. Les Maurice, la majorité des Mauriciens sont d'origine indienne. Mm -hmm. Euh, venus euh, qu'on qu appelle les coulis qui sont venus pour remplacer la main d'œuvre euh, esclave après l'abolition de l'esclavage donc 
la ma majorité des, des Mauriciens sont indiens. Donc, c'est assez naturel pour euh, de faire un film sur cette jeune femme indienne. Euh, mon arrière-grand-mère arrière était indienne tamoule, donc okay. peut-être c'était... Euh, euh, <rire> tout ça s'est mélangé. Donc, euh, voilà. Donc, c'est ça. C'est pour ça que j'ai fait un film sur, sur, sur cette jeune femme qui essaie de se retrouver dans mm -hmm. cet endroit. Puis comment tu pourrais nous parler de ton approche à, à justement au cadre, à l'image, dans ces lieux qui sont très différents? Tu sais, on a le centre d'appel qui est très, très euh, euh, occidental, des bureaux, puis après ça, on a la nuit à l'île Maurice et tout. Est-ce que tu peux nous parler plus de ton approche à, à cette image-là, à ces images-là que tu nous présentes? Donc, Anneksha, elle est, elle, est, elle, est, elle est entre deux mondes. Elle est dans un monde traditionnel mauricien et ce monde contemporain euh, euh, qu'on connaît tous, euh, ce monde euh, occidental. Donc, elle est, elle est dans, cette, dans la balance de ces deux mondes et elle essaie de trouver la façon pour faire un, un, un geste radical pour aller ailleurs, qui est, qui est quand même euh, une question dans le film. Ce n'est pas vraiment résolu comme, comme question, mais... Euh, on voit qu'elle essaie de faire ce geste qui est très complexe quand même pour, euh, pour avancer hors de ces deux mondes dans lesquels elle a, elle a vécu. Donc, au niveau visuel, euh, Antoine Ryan, qui a fait euh, l'image, euh, c'était d'avoir de, de, ces deux mondes, euh, d'avoir quelque chose de très distinct pour ces deux mondes. Et il y a le, le troisième qui est les champs de Cannes, qui ouais. est son, ce non-lieu dans lequel c'est la nuit, dans lequel elle essaie de, de, de se retrouver, de, elle essaie d'en de, sortir aussi. Mm -hmm. Donc, il y a c est, c est, c est les deux mondes, de tra la tradition et ah, euh, le monde oui. occidental, et il y a le non-lieu où on essaie de trouver une, une réponse. Donc, mm -hmm. ces trois lieux ont été approchés euh, visuellement d'une façon différente mm -hmm. euh, par, par Antoine et par moi. Parce qu'on dirait qu'ils font partie de l'histoire, ces lieux-là aussi. On dirait que c'est des personnages à part entière, comme autant Anishka que son superviseur aussi, qui est euh, le reflet de l'occidentalité là-dedans, en fait. Puis qui, lui, a euh, l'air intéressé aussi par elle, a l'air à, euh, mm -hmm. à vouloir interagir. Donc, euh, je trouve qu'il y avait vraiment beaucoup de, de, de niveaux, en fait, de relations dans tout ça. Là. Puis même ouais, les moments ouais. où tu filmes la famille indienne aussi, on dirait que c'est différent aussi que ce qu'on voit ouais, là. Ouais. Oui, ben c'est ça. Il y a les, les, les approches différentes de, de ces trois lieux. Euh, le superviseur euh, Gilles, joué par Laurent Lucas, lui, le, il est un aspect d'un personnage que j'ai, de quelqu'un que j'ai vu rencontrer souvent, euh, tant qu'à l'île Maurice ou en Haïti. C'est toujours euh, euh, une démographie spécifique d'un homme qui vient dans un pays. Et, 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 et l'approche de, 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 de ce personnage, ce n'est pas nécessairement avec des mauvaises intentions du, du tout. Ils sont, ils sont là pour aider. Ils sont... Mais euh, juste le fait de ce qu'ils sont okay. leur donne une, une certaine position de pouvoir. Et dans la famille d'Aneksha, euh, Aline Maurice, la femme est quand même euh, euh, quelqu'un de vulnérable parce que c'est très euh, patriarcal, Aline Maurice. Donc, il y a quand même, encore une fois, une structure de pouvoir où Aniksha doit pouvoir naviguer à travers. Oh, ben, merci beaucoup, Vincent, pour ces, euh, ces formations. Merci. Um, donc, uh, any last word you want to share about your film? Est-ce que vous avez des mots de la fin de, sur vos films dont on n'a pas encore parlé avant qu'on termine la discussion? Non. It's okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for being with us and uh, to discuss your film. And also, it was a pleasure to present them and program them together. Donc, merci de, de, de nous avoir rejoints sur cette vidéoconférence pour parler de vos films. J'ai été très heureuse de les présenter, les programmer ensemble. So if you like uh, this program, please don't be shy and share it on social media. The film will be available online until... October 31st.